Hey, everybody. I was just waiting for my slides, but I, I know how it begins. <laughs> uh, and that is actually the last slide. That is the first slide. Um, so uh, my name is Karen. Um, I am the executive director of an organization called the Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, I've been very involved with the GNOME Foundation. Uh, I am a lawyer, which sometimes when I confess, I feel like I have to hide behind the podium lest you throw rotten things at me. Uh, but I only do pro bono legal uh, advice now, and I do that for the Free Software Foundation and GNOME and a number of other uh, free software related organizations. Uh, I'm a free and open source software enthusiast, and I'm also a patient. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that so you get an idea of who I am. Um, and these are my Twitter handle uh, and Conservancy's Twitter handle. So I know if you're focused on your device that you're totally tweeting how awesome this is. And I keep it up. Um, so as I said, I'm a, I'm a patient. I have a literally three times the size of a normal person's heart. Uh, it's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And my heart is really thick. Um, and uh, it's totally fine. I'm asymptomatic. Um, as you can see, I, I'm not really held back so much. Um, and uh, the only real problem is that I have an extremely high risk of suddenly dying. It's like 2 to 3 percent per year um, compounding. And I was diagnosed at age 30. So the, the prognosis over the 10 years was, was really not so good. And so my doctor, um, you know, I went to all these cardiologists and electrophysiologists. geologists. They say, oh, well, not a problem, because uh, you can get a pacemaker defibrillator. And then if you go into the medical term is sudden death. <laughs> if you go into sudden death, not to worry, the device will shock you. It's like people following you around with paddles clear and shocking you, and, and you'll be fine. And my first question was, what does it run? To which the cardiologist was like, run? And, and the cardiologist had never really understood that there was software on the devices that he was implanting. And this guy implanted sometimes multiple devices per day. He had implanted thousands upon thousands of these devices in the course of his career. And they just hadn't thought about the software uh, on it. I, at the time, was a lawyer working on software freedom. And, so, and I'd been a, a developer in college. And so for me, this was like a natural point of inquiry. And I thought, well, no problem, because the medical device manufacturers will allow me, or certainly be understanding, that I will want to review the code that's in my own body. Not so much, as it turns out. Um, I even offered to sign an NDA, um, do whatever it took to be able to review the code, and I basically got nowhere. Um, after a lot of soul searching and delay, because no one wants to think about their own mortality and thinking about whether or not to get this device was really stressful, so I would just kind of put it off. And um, I realized that I couldn't put it off anymore. Um, the risk of death was too high. So I decided to get the defibrillator and uh, become a cyborg lawyer, which is terrifying, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so this is a picture of uh, Bill Gates as a, as a Borg, uh, if you don't know. So I, I literally have proprietary software connected to my heart, which is crazy. The, um, the really interesting thing about this experience is that when I started out, I thought open source was cool. I thought it was useful. I liked collaboration. But I didn't really think about the deeper ideological questions until my life depended on it in a very literal way, right? I didn't even, you know, I, and I was involved in the field. But at the same time, it didn't really hit home until that point. And then once you start, once you start thinking about how your life relies on your pacemaker defibrillator, it's a very short walk to your car, you know? Um, and, and all these, you know, your, your voting machines, your stock markets, and everybody here is, uh, is technical enough and smart enough that you all know how much our lives rely on software every day. And for me, this, was, um, this made me passionate about software freedom. And in that time, there were various hacks that showed how these, um, you know, how these devices um, and products were vulnerable. I like this one. This is a, 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 a car hack which is really fun because, as you can see, the, uh, the dial is at 140 miles per hour, but the car thinks it's in park. 
And then they changed the message that it says uh, pwned, which I thought was really funny. Um, the, the Software Engineering Institute estimates that there's one bug introduced for every 100 lines of code, um, which surprised me. I mean, I, we all know that there are lots of bugs in software, but that was higher than I had expected. Um, and uh, so I, you know, looking at the one in 100, you can sort of think, well, if the average premium class car has 100 million lines of code in it, well, one in 100, like around a million. So even if the vast majority of bugs are caught, it's a lot of bugs. Um, and there are hacks in all, all kinds of other spaces. And of course, you know, we're talking a lot about Internet of Things and how it's the next big thing for our space and how important that is. But as, every, as software is talking to everything else, as every piece of software is talking to everything else, the line of what is life and society critical becomes extremely blurry. Right, what, what we're gonna, like the, when the, the, um, the researchers tried to show that the cars were vulnerable, they didn't go straight for the brake systems or the ignition systems, right? They, they go through the wheel maintenance systems and the, um, you know, and the entertainment systems, for example. Um, so, you know, all, all of our software is, is, is vulnerable and, and, and as, it, as it, you explore this area, you realize that software is something that you should be passionate about and many of us here are involved in this field because we're passionate about software. Um, for me, that meant moving from being primarily a lawyer to being uh, to working on alternatives and free and open source software. So the Software Freedom Conservancy, where I'm executive director, has over 30 free and open source software projects, uh, many of which I know you're all using, <laughs> like Git. And uh, there's Git Samoa. QEMU just uh, joined, and I know that QEMU is really um, important in this space. Um, and we. Uh, we basically serve as the, the charitable home for all of these free software projects, and um, I, I really love uh, working on that. One of our projects that we have is, uh, is not on that slide, and it is uh, perhaps the thing that we get the most press about, even though it's not necessarily the thing that we spend the most time on. Um, a lot of the things we spend the time on are helping developers get to conferences and dealing with trademark situations and things like that. Um, but, uh, but one of our, our, our projects is the GPL compliance project for kernel developers. Um, so uh, we have a coalition of developers who are interested in having Conservancy help be stewards for their license um, as enforcement. And, uh, and as we all here know, the kernel is in everything. There's free software in everything. There's GPM code in everything. Um, and, yet, uh, and yet, perhaps we have less freedom than ever before because our freedom is at lower levels and a lot of the software gets wrapped in proprietary code. And I actually am seeing a ton of nodding here. I mean, this is the, the, the message that we've been getting where as a, as a charitable nonprofit, we serve the community um, and we're, we're focused on, um, on, on answering. So, so, so what we do is, uh, uh, is, is we answer these complaints about um, violations because companies have been sort of pushing the line as far as they can and pushing their compliance out um, and uh, it's our job to sort of knock on the door and say, hey, so we got a report that you're not in compliance. You know, let's talk about it. What, what, what can we do about it? Um, and it's, it's interesting because there are, there's so much money saved by using free and open source software. Um, it's why so many of you are here. It's so valuable and important. And the kernel in particular is so valuable and important. Um, and yet, um, freedom has become much more precarious. This is a, a, a really fascinating security uh, study that I read. It's called the honeymoon effect. Um, has anybody here heard of the honeymoon effect before? Wow, okay, no one, great. I'm here to tell you about the honeymoon effect. <laughs> the, the honeymoon effect is this really interesting, it's not about drinks on the beach, although I wish it were. Um, it basically looked at the number of bugs over time in a piece of software, which that curve is as you would expect. Generally, the number of bugs in a piece of software decreases over time. Uh, there's a little uptick at the end. Um, but what the honeymoon effect was is they studied that against vulnerabilities, known vulnerabilities. And what they found was completely different. What they found was that the number of vulnerabilities at the beginning is flat, it's zero, for various reasons that they posit are social reasons and other reasons. So for some period of time, call it, they call it the honeymoon period. 
because that's when your software is first released and you're in a honeymoon with them and nothing, you, know, you don't have any known vulnerabilities during that time. And then once one bug is found, then the, the, the curve goes up tremendously and it's uh, vulnerability after vulnerability. And, um, and what's fascinating to me about this is that what it tells you is that it's not today or tomorrow that you have to worry about vulnerabilities, it's down the road, which is potentially when relationships with suppliers, relationships with key developers have broken down, when your core developers have left and haven't put it the proper infrastructure. It's, you know, it, it, the only way that you can be sure that you can deal with that security vulnerability all the way down the road is if you have complete and corresponding source code and can install it and can modify it. So if you have a bug, that's a security, major security vulnerability and your core team has changed or your supplier has changed or you don't have a great relationship, then you're in trouble without copy left or without completing corresponding source code, which uh, the GPL, how many people here have read the GPL, the GPL v2? Oh, awesome, like three quarters of the audience, that's great. Um, if you haven't read it, it's quite a good read. <laughs> Maybe that's the lawyer in me, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and so uh, copyleft is, is, is good for everyone in the long run. It's why we, the Linux kernel has such a dynamic collaborative community around it, right? The, uh, Linus has said on many occasions uh, publicly and otherwise that he thinks that the biggest contribution he has made is choosing the license of the, the kernel, um, not necessarily anything technical. And it's created this enormous collaborative environment. All of that is predicated on copyleft, which is um, really extremely exciting. Um, I already heard about VW this week. <laughs> um, and, and I found this to be really, really fascinating, right? Because what happened with VW was so dramatic, right? What the company was doing was so far from what consumers were expecting them to do that I want you to ask yourself how many engineers were in-house at VW and knew that VW wasn't doing the right thing? and either tried to call attention to it or felt like they didn't have the power to. And at the end of the day, not doing the right thing not only has security implications, like I was talking about before, where our cars and our defibrillators have already shown to be vulnerable. All of our software is potentially vulnerable. Everybody here knows that. Anyone who's a hacker knows that. Um, but, but also for the bottom line, which is to say that it's been a huge disaster for VW. Right? It's been a, a huge disaster for them financially. And I think what it demonstrates is the proposition that companies, when left to their own devices, won't necessarily think long term. And as engineers, now I'm, I'm really old school. So when I was in uh, uni and taking engineering classes, and um, I, there, was this, there was a really huge ethical component. And we spent the very first semester of engineering school doing nothing in one class but studying engineering failures which is perhaps why I became uh, a little bit idealistic and uh, ideological about technology. Um, and and, and those, those failures are, are really galvanizing to see how people rely on technology from a societal way and the responsibility and the power of developers. So um, what we've done to respond to this is uh, Conservancy established the GPL compliance project for kernel developers where kernel developers could join because developers are not necessarily the personality types to want to stick their neck out and say, there, this is a real problem and I demand that you do the right thing. For one thing, it can be really hard on employment. <laughs> um, a lot of companies don't want to employ developers who, or say they don't, but I think that's actually starting to change, who are outwardly ideological about their software. So we made this coalition such that kernel developers can join in an anonymous way and join the coalition and then we represent them and help companies come into compliance in, in, a, in a friendly and, uh, and coordinated way. So we represent a lot of developers. Companies are not getting knocks on the door from all these different people. We are one voice, we're coordinating, and we have um, you know, the knowledge and the principled way of approaching the situation that can, um, can really help. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we announced that Conservancy also uh, has uh, answered the Debian community and has launched a Debian copyright aggregation project. 
So Debian actually asked Conservancy to hold copyrights, um, and now some kernel developers have taken advantage of that as well. So Conservancy is now a copyright holder in the kernel, um, too. Um, but I want to tell you a story because it's a brief time slot <laughs> of, uh, of uh, a story that started in 2011, uh, where we got a violation report and started pursuing a company named VMware, which I think everybody here has probably heard of. Um, VMware is a huge company with over 14,000 employees. Um, they're really big, and their GPL violations were famous in the community. Now, as a, as a lawyer, I, you know, I was an engineer, but then I went and became a corporate securities lawyer. And then when I came back to the field, I, you know, I, was, I was a little out of it. And, the, um, and learning, this is back in 2005 um, and, you know, and, and right after that. And so when I was sort of, one of the first things that I heard about VMware was that they were violating the GPL from developers who were really angry. And, um, and uh, so we started a, uh, we Conservancy started a um, uh, dialogue with VMware where we encouraged them to uh, come into compliance. And we had some back and forth and eventually that kind of stalled, so we consulted our allies, our trade association allies, um, like the Linux Foundation and, uh, and uh, other uh, corporate entities that could help us compel action and to, um, and to move things forward. And actually, for a while, we, we made real progress, and a lot of the violations were addressed, and more of the, you know, the source code candidates they were providing were better, but we reached a point where they just weren't providing any more. And, uh, and no matter how we went back and forth. And so uh, we started in 2011. And in 2014, finally, we got to the point where we felt like we really couldn't compel any more action. Now, this is cr it's, for anyone who has dealt with any legal action, um, knows that this is incredibly slow escalation because from our perspective, we're a community organization, right? We don't want to be threatening. We don't want people to feel bad about compliance. We want people, we want companies to feel very good about using the Linux kernel, about using BusyBox, about using free and open source software. We want to encourage adoption. We don't want to scare people away. So we move slow and we, 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 we're, we're probably too nice. <laughs> and uh, and we, we, we ask for, 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 for them to do the right thing. And eventually in 2014, all those years later, we realized that um, they, they, they said that was it. They were not going to do anything else. They, said, they actually said that they believed they were in compliance. Um, and, uh, and at that point, almost all of our coalition had been anonymous. Um, and Christoph Helwig uh, is a developer who, uh, who decided to become public with his participation in the coalition, and um, I'm, I'm sure many of you know him. Uh, these stats are actually a little bit old. I think his, uh, his ranking is a little bit higher in the 4.0 uh, cycle, but he's a, a, a pretty consistent contributor to the Linux kernel. And so we, uh, he, he wound up, uh, we briefed him, and he wound up um, pursuing the case um, in, in Germany. And he's motivated because he's an ideological kernel developer, and he cares. He, but he's also a, you know, a, a business person, and not having the collaborative environment that the GPL promises hurts not only his business interests, but the business interests of the industry as a whole. So uh, the, the, there, um, I can't, the, the, so the, we brought, uh, this is a technical situation of the, uh, of the case. Where, um, uh, where VMware is using code from the kernel um, under v2 and distributes the, uh, the kernel modules together with proprietary components. Um, and I think the most interesting thing uh, in the, uh, or one of the most interesting things in the technical situation is that, uh, is that VMware adopted the uh, proprietary parts and the GPL parts uh, to optimize them, make them work together. Um, I, uh, we have an FAQ on the Conservancy's website that goes into as much detail as we as we possibly can, uh, because uh, all this happens in uh, is, was happening in Germany, and Germany has very different rules than the U.S. on bringing lawsuits. Which, uh, as a U.S. lawyer, and I was embarrassed to be so U.S. centric, but as a U.S. lawyer, I was shocked. You you normally have um, in 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 U.S. cases, you expect. 
uh, you, you expect for court documents to be made public, but in Germany, it's a very privacy-focused uh, system, which makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways, uh, but we're very limited in what we can talk about. Um, but we basically published as much as we possibly could, and it's Christoph who is bringing the suit, not Conservancy, so uh, we talk a little bit about what we found on our own, which is separate from the case. Uh, but we also have information on there so that you can check out the code yourself and determine what you think. Um, and eventually, after a lot of back and forth, uh, VMware wanted Christoph to sign an NDA just to look at a settlement offer, not even to sign a settlement offer. Um, and we all realized that there was a limit to these discussions and how productive they could be. It was, we had done everything possible short of litigation. And so Christoph filed a lawsuit in, uh, in Germany and Conservancy funded uh, that lawsuit. And so it's ongoing now and uh, it's, uh, I, I wish I could say more, but as I said, the, the, the rules in Germany are such that, uh, that I, we need VMware to agree. <laughs> So, so contact VMware and ask them <laughs> for us to be able to say more. Um, but as far as I know, this is the first case on derivative works, right? This is the first case that tests the question of that part of the GPL, which is essential to the choice of the GPL and essential to how we've been functioning as an ecosystem and how we expect the license to function. And, uh, and I think companies, because no lawsuits had been brought, we started to treat the GPL like the LGPL. They started to treat the GPL as if the derivatives component didn't even exist. Um, and so when we brought the lawsuit, some of these people are, are in the room, the support for the suit was, um, was impressive. And what, uh, what gets me is that I, anything where you have the FSF and OSI <laughs> coming out in support at the same time, uh, you, you know you're doing something right. <laughs> And, um, and so we'll, you know, we'll see how, how that turns out. I mean, from my perspective, uh, from my perspective, having a lawsuit on derivative works, this has been the big question. Lawyers have been making these analyses behind closed doors in their own, uh, in their own legal teams individually and, um, and imposing what their interpretation is and their risk analysis is on the developers and the engineering teams that are parts of their companies. In, you know, and, and there's been a lot of guessing because where there is no case law, you sort of have to figure out what you think the risks are. Um, but if there's no consequence to violating the license at the end of the day, if at the end of the day there is no problem and there are no negative effects, then no one will ever follow the GPL. The GPL will effectively be like a permissive license because there's, there's no, there, there are no consequences. So, uh, you, you know, there are a lot of great discussions about compliance and really good work that's going on to help, um, you know, be custodians for, um, for the code and, 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 and to help companies understand what their obligations are. But at the end of the day, if there's no chance of a lawsuit, then you can't take even that first step. No company will want to spend the money or the time or the resources in making sure that things are done right in order to, you know, to just do the right thing if there's no possibility of a negative effect. Companies like the, in the Volkswagen case, right, they, companies often are thinking short term and not long term and they're not necessarily thinking in terms of the industry. And I think Lenaro and trade associations like it are really valuable and important because they give a chance for competitors and, um, you know, and companies to work together to think about these long-term advantages. And compliance and bringing an enforcement lawsuit is actually a service that we do for the community at large because we're, um, you know, because we're in the situation where we represent these kernel developers and we're a charity and on the ideological side, but it helps the long-term business strategies of all of the companies uh, that participate in the space. And I think that one of the things that we've had is, is is problems communicating that. And for all the developers in the room, this is where you're really powerful because communicating the technological advantages to copy left and how much better your product will be over time and from cycle to cycle to cycle is something that you can do with management and you can do with legal and that will bring them 
on board, the best lawyers that I have encountered in-house at companies are ones that have partnered with engineers, they've partnered with developers, and really get it from a fundamental technological side. And um, on my part, I'm, I'm focused on trying to, uh, to bring that message to the management side on behalf of the community. And one of the things I'm doing, actually wasn't expecting to mention this, but now I am, <laughs> uh, that I'm, I'm actually, the uh, Linux Foundation has a um, individual membership program, and those members can vote for two, um, two board seats. And so I'm gonna run for a board seat um, in order to sort of bring some of this dialogue on behalf of the community to the companies that are members of the Linux Foundation. Um, because, you know, uh, I think, we need you to talk to, um, you know, to talk to your partners and to talk to um, management about what, um, you know, the values of copyleft and why it's so important to do the right thing. Um, but we need to have this dialogue on a lot of different levels. But I hope you can sense for me that I'm a really non-confrontational person. <laughs> uh, we don't want to bring lawsuits. We don't want litigation. That last step should be an absolute last resort. We shouldn't have lawsuits. We should have companies doing the right thing. Um, and so Conservancy is focused on doing a lot of, as many initiatives as we can to help with compliance in non-litigation ways. Um, so we launched copyleft.org, which has a lot of information about understanding the GPL and um, copyleft generally. Uh, and uh, one of the cool things that we launched with it, uh, and it's a part, we, we've done it in partnership with the Free Software Foundation, um, which is pretty fun. And one of the things that we added uh, recently is a, uh, a really a, a almost pure, complete and corresponding source code so companies can see how to comply. Because I think as there's been questions of, you know, what is good compliance, what are you looking for? It's, you know, people sometimes say, you're moving the goalpost because we don't really understand. And saying, just look at the GPL and see what the requirements are is tough. So we've published an explanation of what we look for and a source, and a source candidate that actually um, does things right. So you can take a look at that. And free software in general is, uh, and open source is essential to our society for all of these fundamental ways that we're, we're building all this infrastructure on technology that is going to last for a long time that we're building on and coordinating together. And if we don't, bring as much freedom as we can to as much of it, we're going to have problems down the road. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that Conservancy does also is recognizing that the communities that create free software and uh, create copyleft are, um, are also representative of the uh, community as a whole. And we notice, and I, I normally don't like to talk about this too much when I'm talking about other things, but coming into a conference where there are so few women, for example, <laughs> is, uh, is always a little bit jarring for me as a woman, and, and it's a little off-putting, and it's something that people don't necessarily think about. And so uh, we have a program called Outreachy, which is formerly the Outreach Program for Women that has paid internships for women, and the Linux kernel participates in this um, with, uh, with some really good success. And then uh, this week we've announced that the next round is not just going to apply to women and um, you know and uh, uh, trans people and gender queer people, but also to uh, to men who are in the so the tech companies in the U.S. in the last year have published stats um, where they talked about their diversity numbers, which are totally abysmal. So we've opened the uh, the uh, program just to the categories on the lower part of the, the completely underrepresented groups. So uh, so for example. Um, uh, it's open to, uh, to, to anyone, so to men who are uh, a black or African-American, Latino, Hispanic, or American Indian. So it's, it's growing. Uh, it's been really successful, and women are now a real part of, of the communities that have participated. And the uh, outreach program for women shows up in kernel stats now and again, which is pretty fun. Not as, not as high as Lenaro, but, uh, <laughs> but the fact that it's there at all is, is pretty cool. Um, and these are really big problems, the problems around compliance, the problems around our infrastructure, and the problems around diversity. They're, we're not going to be able to fix them today or tomorrow, but we, we need your help. Free software has been one of those. Free software versus open source, the fact that there's a versus is crazy. Bringing the ideology, bringing the ideas behind software freedom into open source, understanding that the benefits we get from open source come from the, the freedom that these things are, are intricately linked are, are really important and we need everyone's help in order to do that. 
Um, ideology is the key for success commercially and otherwise, and we have to keep that in mind. So if anyone here wants to join our Kernel Coalition, you can come talk to me um, or get involved in any other way. And I'll leave you with this, which is that three million people in the world have pacemakers, and every year 600,000 are implanted. And this is true in every industry, right? So I joke that I'm a cyborg, it's a little cheeky, but if we're lucky, we're all gonna be cyborgs. And all of our equipment is going to interact with and rely on other equipment. And so, you know, I don't wanna to be too dramatic while I stand here and say, think of the children, <laughs> but, but, uh, but think of the children. <laughs> and think of, think of yourselves as we age. It's, uh, it's choose software freedom bring it to your profession for your future cyborg self. And uh, please become a member of the, of the supporter of the Software Freedom Conservancy. We are a public charity and really appreciate your support. I wanna touch over, does anybody, can we, do we have time for questions or? Does anybody have any questions? Uh, oh, oh, I'm calling. I thought, yeah, I thought the, I have a question. the microphone choosing was the asking. <laughs> so is the objective of the Conservancy copyright grant that the Conservancy can raise lawsuits on behalf of a community of engineers, having someone like Christopher have to raise the lawsuit himself? I'm so, sorry, what was the, the question? Is the point of the software Conservancy copyright Oh, the point of the Software Freedom Conservancy is a charity around software freedom. We embody all of our free and open source software projects, so we enable uh, our, our member projects to do all kinds of things, and one of our, two of our member projects now ask us to do copyright stewardship for them. We have a lot of um, member projects who are not even copyleft, who are permissively licensed, and so they're not interested in enforcement at all. So one of the things that we do is that on behalf of the communities that want it, like the Linux kernel and the Debian community, uh, we, have, uh, we have that services that we provide. There are some questions over here, or? Oh, okay. There's a question right there. Um, when will Freeze and Freedom be back on air? <laughs> <laughs> Freeze and Freedom is an is a, an Ogcast, as I call it, or podcast uh, is an Ogcast uh, that I record with uh, Bradley Kuhn, where we talk about legal and policy issues in free and open source software. And we have two episodes that have been recorded that will be coming out. And uh, and so we we talk about things like we go in more depth about things like the VMware lawsuit and things about things that conservancy are doing, but also just things that are relevant in free and open source software. And you can check it out at faif.us, F-A-I-F for free as in freedom, dot U-S. There's one more over there, yeah. So what are the options to get consulted on some, some aspects of licenses and compliance? So what are options for consulting with uh, to, uh, for being consulted on compliance issues. So, for example, I have a question if I'm in compliance or somebody else in compliance. Where can I seek for help? Well, so, uh, so there's actually a, a, a little bit of an industry around compliance, which is really interesting. And there are different companies that can help uh, with that. Uh, and there are individual contractors that do some of that work, too. Um, we're focused on providing information as much to the public as possible, as transparently as possible, which is why we have copyleft.org. Um, we're not a legal services organization, so we can't provide direct legal advice, um, but, uh, uh, but, you can, uh, but you can ask us questions and we'll try to answer them or point you to people who, uh, who have the, the right question. You can't rely, you know, it's the classic lawyerly answer of it depends, and, uh, and uh, this is not legal advice and I'm not your lawyer. Um, but uh, but sometimes we can point you to a resource that's general and that will have the answer that you need. Anybody else? Well, yeah. Oh well, thank thank you very much. Um, uh, if you have any questions, if you want to join our coalition, I really appreciate your time and thank you for supporting software freedom.
Um, yeah, thank you very, very much. That was uh, very interesting. Um, they are a very, very nice.